Thank you very much for the generous introduction and thank you to um, <coughs> Sophie for inviting me to come and speak in this series. I'm delighted to be here and uh, to be a part of this year's programme. Uh, and uh, I have to sort of give a big thanks to Mark in advance for being my uh, technical assistance with the clips, which I hope will go according to plan. Anyway, this, this paper that I'll uh, present today is extracted from the book, really, um, Framing Muslims. And um, when <coughs> Sophie contacted me, I um, thought quite a bit about what I would do. I've done sort of various papers based around the book, and uh, we've done some of the hard topics, and we've done some of the sort of um, soft, so I, I don't know you know, if there's a hard topic or a soft topic when it comes to Muslims, but anyway, it's, it's um, comedy was something that was a part of the book which comes in towards the end and is something that I haven't publicly presented on, so I thought this would be a good opportunity to do it. And <clears throat> also because it's really about breaking the stereotype and breaking the frame and it's what we conclude with and not what we begin with. So there's, uh, I'll, when I do, uh, just when I start formally the presentation, in the beginning I'll just give you a very brief introduction to what the sort of general idea of the book is about and then I'll jump four, five chapters <laughs> and take you right to the end to performing beyond the stereotype. And I'd be happy to answer any other questions in connection to the earlier part in the Q&A. So please feel free to ask. And uh, there, as, as was mentioned, there's a train to catch, but I'm quite happy to receive questions via emails and there's cards and stuff lying around. So please do take them with you. Right. OK, so <clears throat> Islam and freedom, are they destined to clash? That's a headline from Newsweek. Muhammad Khartoum Rao intensifies a headline from the BBC. Burqa makes women prisoners, says President Sarkozy. It's a headline from the Times. Universities urge to spy on Muslims, a headline from the Guardian. The headlines that scream out at us every day from news hoardings and television screens seem unanimous in the picture they paint of Muslims. Unenlightened outsiders who, while they may live and work in the West, still have an allegiance to values different from those recognized in Europe and North America. Whether the controversy is over, over veiling cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad, conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq and Israel, Palestine, or protests about the knighthood given to Salman Rushdie, Muslims appear always as a problematic presence, troubling those values of individualism and freedom said to define Western nations. In the last decade or so, politicians, the media, and concerned public bodies have vigorously debated the impact of global migration and the mixing of cultures and ethnicities. At no time since the 1930s have questions about the position of the outsider in Western society been raised so persistently, troubling fashionable notions of the decline of the nation state in the age of globalized capitalism and boundless consumer culture. Along with this, as media forms and outlets have proliferated, has come an interest in the way images of ethnic minority or migrant groups are constructed, circulated, and used in contemporary society. Yet, paradoxically, this period of cultural hypersensitivity and relativism has also seen an increase in the tendency to deploy stereotyped imagery in the depiction of some communities. A development that sits uneasily beside the ostensibly inclusive agendas of modern liberal politics. Since the terrorist attacks of September 2001, the discussion with all its revealing anxieties and ambivalences is overwhelmingly focused on the position of Muslims in relation to what is often depicted as a monolithic West. The image, and in, you know, in, in the book we kind of problematize this, this idea looking at the sort of history of it as well. Um, the images that emerge and 
which are repeated and circulated through modern channels of communication are often little more than caricatures in which the propensity for extremism and violence of a small segment of politicized Islam is magnified and projected onto Muslim communities around the world. The result is that what ought to be a free and frank dialogue over the sacred and the secular, the role of politics in religion and vice versa, and how identity politics can accommodate religious self-fashioning instead becomes beset with recrimination and misrepresentation. Negative images of Muslims do not cause alienation or radicalization, and I think that's quite important to, to sort of uh, say that is not what we argue in the book. Um, <clears throat> the, the sort of title is, uh, is ironic rather than um, explanatory. Uh, negative images of Muslims do not cause alienation or radicalization. Nonetheless, substituting simplistic and politically manageable views of a sizable portion of contemporary global citizenry in place of unwieldy and complex realities must have a detrimental effect on the quality of political decision making, community relations and public debate. In our book, we critically analyze such recurring yet reductive images. Most contemporary attempts to address this issue have focused on one or two particular genres of representation to construct an argument for the inherent bias and negative stereotyping such forms are deemed to reproduce. Our interest rather lies in attempting to produce an interdisciplinary understanding of the representation of Muslims in the diaspora, both by various mainstream media and by those invested with the power to speak from within on behalf of a notionally homogenous set of interests. We are concerned with how these representations operate within carefully regulated agendas and how they often work to reproduce those ideological assumptions they are supposedly in the business of interrogating and deconstructing. We therefore pay attention to the processes by which such images are constructed those features that are used again and again becoming a default signifier of the mistrusted Muslim and how their circulation takes place within different cultural modes of practice and against particular political backgrounds. In the years since 9-11, the full force of sociology, political science, anthropology, religious studies and history have all been brought into play to explore the supposed schism by, by which relations between Islam and the West and the place of Muslims in the West have been violently reconfigured. Such disciplinary work has already shed important light on the contextual markers of our current situation. What it has been less consistent in acknowledging and exploring is the textual transmission by which reductive images of Muslims are circulated. For all the much vaunted and recently criticized multiculturalism of urban metropolises. It is still the case that large, proportion, large portions of the populations of nations in the West rarely, if ever, knowingly meet a Muslim. Yet surveys consistently show a high level of suspicion and mistrust across the board in these countries. This amount of hostility and fear cannot be understood without due attention being paid to those texts. Journalistic, dramatic, televisual, literary, and so on, by which images of Muslims are transmitted to various audiences. In our book, we draw on the insights of a number of academic disciplines. But we also attempt to bring together, synthesize, question, and go beyond their boundaries. We would go so far as to say that while work in a single discipline can increase our knowledge of the subject, a fuller understanding along with the potential for meaningful interventions to change a situation in which Muslims are still habitually stereotyped can only come from a multidisciplinary approach that is aware of the textual transmission of such images while at the same time accepting its own involvement in the longer history of these very same representations. 
It has become something of a truism to remark on how stereotyping says more about the person or group doing the stereotyping than it does about the group being stereotyped. Yet we need to try to fill in precisely what that means. In other words, why stereotype? What satisfaction and consolation can be gained from painting people in garish primary colours instead of acknowledging the actual pied beauty of humanity? How are reductive stereotypes constructed and how are they circulated? The answers to these questions take us into the realms of psychology, sociology, politics, the media and the close reading techniques of literary studies, giving us cause to think about the relation between what motivates individuals, the groups into which they form themselves and the cultural expressions to which they give rise. In our book, we analyze a range of examples of cultural texts where Muslims have been discursively fixed in limiting ways from a number of contexts to better show both the ubiquity of the practice and subtle variations, hesitancies and contradictions which in inevitably appear. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's sort of chapters on um, sort of, uh, well, there are chapters on many things. But we look at different case studies. We've got a case study of Islamic Rage Boy, which is this example of um, a professional Muslim protester as an example of a stereotype that you come across in the media quite regularly. Uh, we also look at the broader context of Muslims, multiculturalism, and the media. And we're uh, looking at how certain issues like for example, honor killings can be um, projected in a certain way and framed in amongst news agendas that are set already about a particular topic. And um, then we also look at sort of representations from within and look at examples of the Muslim Council of Britain to see, you know, what are some of the um, stereotypes that are coming from within the community to, to sort of, so it's not to say that stereotypes only come from outside, you know, they also come from inside and it's uh, kind of going on, off. it's a dialogic process, we argue. Um, and we, in our readings, you know, we, we sort of use psychoanalysis and different types of um, reading um, strategies, in, including the, strat uh, the idea of framing to see uh, which comes from communication studies and Maxwell McCombs's work in setting the agenda in particular to try and understand and to build a, a kind of methodology of how one can read the stereotype and understand it and sort of take it further from what Edward Said um, did originally in his work on um, covering Islam and um, Orientalism. And so it, it's sort of uh, taking that debate forward with methodological approaches. Um, so it is as if the attempt to solder together a watertight worldview based on civilizational difference, whether carried out by those hostile to Islam or those feeling the need to aggressively propagate it, can never really be successful. The vessel in which cultural purists set sail is always, in the end, a leaky one that requires constant bailing. One of the forms of stereotyping that we consider in this book and, and uh, this is where I'm sort of making quite a big leap, so um, please bear with me. One of the forms of stereotyping that we consider in this book is that of the normative visual stereotype of the Muslim woman that has emerged both out of Western stereotypes of Muslims and the self-stereotyping that occurs amongst Muslims living in Western societies. Gender stereotypes have a long history that have been noted by scholars such as Moja Kaf, who has shown how depictions of Muslim women have changed through, through the centuries from medieval fascination with the symbolic figure of the powerful Eastern queen to post 18th century romantic notions of the passive oriental female cooped up in the harem or behind the veil, waiting to be rescued by the Western male hero. Kaf points out how this shifting view of the Muslim woman coincides with changes in European models of femininity, which themselves came more to emphasize the chaste middle class woman inhabiting domestic space. Yet, as we know, the idea of freeing the Muslim woman from Islamic male tyranny is a trope with tremendous emotional appeal and longevity. It was used to justify military interventions in the Gulf in 1991 
and more recently the rescue of oppressed women has been behind feminist support for the invasions of Afghanistan in 2001 and Iraq in 2003 and uh, politically you know uh, sort of prominent women like Cherie Blair and Barbara Bush took up the, the sort of cause as well and, and we talk about that briefly in the book. The veil itself has a complex historical narrative that is tied to power and politics in the Muslim world and the West. In our book, we argue that historically, on the level of form, Muslims are most often conjured up in one of two ways. A long-standing and still much favoured mode of indicating difference is through metonymy. Muslim women wear the hijab, men appear bearded, praying, or both. In each case, dress, beards, and acts stand in for the whole person, denoting cultural orientation, religious commitment, and thus to secular society otherness. While various chapters in our book focus on television, film, and docudrama to consider the powerful messages that are contained in the evocation of these images, I want to draw your attention to our ending case study on the subject matter of gender, comedy, and self-stereotyping. Since perhaps the most persistent stereotype in the pantheon of fixed images of Muslims is the veiled woman, it might seem profitable to think about the way the simple piece of cloth has taken on an enormous significance in accounts of cultural difference. Um, I mean, it goes across Europe, doesn't it? The veiled woman at once signifies piety and oppression, modesty and the failure to integrate. In the light of this conflicted signification, those instances where this and other recurring stereotypes are taken up, subtly undermined and contested in what we would call an exaggerated or hyper-performative way are instructive. More particularly, in thinking about the destabilizing effect of comedy and the power of laughter to puncture solemn absolutes, we arguably identify a powerful site of resistance to deterministic views of cultural fixity and irresolvable difference. These issues are played out in the career of Britain's most prominent female Muslim comedian, Shazia Mirza. Mirza rose to prominence in the weeks after the 9-11 attacks owing to her stage costume, tapped by, um, topped by an austere black hijab, and her willingness to squeeze humour out of uncomfortable topics and confront audience expectations head on. Her notorious opening line, instrumental in catapulting her into the public consciousness, was, Hello, I'm Shazia Mirza. At least, that's what it says on my pilot's license. Her feisty persona immediately challenged the stereotype of the passive, browbeaten Muslim woman while her deadpan delivery hinted at and travestied the idea of Muslims as humorless automata. A British Pakistani woman from Birmingham, she represents a shift in the centre of gravity of ethnic comedy in Britain after the golden age of the late 1990s, with its Indo chic and celebration of all things ethnic. Prominent among the numerous television shows capturing this multicultural moment was the BBC's Goodness Gracious Me, featuring a quartet of British Indian comedians which worked to expose some of the attitudes towards South Asians still prevalent in mainstream white society in a series of sketches often operating through a reversal of stereotypes or an exposure of their vacuity. At the same time, the program acknowledged the existence of stereotyping and prejudice within and between diasporic communities themselves. With its subtle, <coughs> multivalent humour, the show was quickly co-opted as an example of successful multicultural Britain. The triumph of integration could be read in the fact that the various ethnicities that made up Britain could unite over a good joke. After 9-11 and during the emergence of a less tractable brand of assertive ethno-religious identity, negative stereotypes closed in, mainly around Britain's Muslims, but also by implication the South Asian population more generally, or anyone who might look Muslim. In response to these changed conditions, the more assertive presentational style of someone like Shazia Mirza operates on the margins of good taste, provoking and unsettling. And I think it's a good moment to show you a clip to unsettle you a little bit. <laughs> Oh, my wedding day, you know. I can't wait to meet 
hate my husband. <laughs> husband. Um, well, my friend Julie, she says to me, you know, how can you sleep with someone you don't know? I said, well, you do it all the time. <laughs> with my burqa on, dressed like this, and this woman, she refused to sit next to me. Obviously, she hadn't watched Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to her, I'm going to sit on this plane and blow it up, and you think you're going to be safer three rows back? <laughs> I don't think I can sort of top that, really. Uh, after 9-11 and during the emergence of a less tractable brand of... Oh, sorry, I've done that. No. Emma Tarlow has described Mirza as employing the art of sartorial provocation and shows how her subversion operates on several levels. And I'm quoting from Emma. By donning a hijab, she was at one level simply claiming the right to speak about Muslims as a Muslim. But in doing so, she was, of course, picking up on one of the most sacred and semiotically saturated contemporary symbols of our times and taking it into the very spaces it was least expected to frequent, the tainted, macho, bear-swilling world of London's pubs and clubs from which good Muslims were, by definition, self-excluded. In effect, Shazia used the hijab as a powerful means of exposing and reflecting back to her predominantly white male audiences Western stereotypes of Muslims at a time of extreme political tension and sensitivity." Unquote. So once more, the idea of a heightened, parodic, hyper-performance is a useful way to think about how Mirza's interventions troubles, ex um, how Mirza's intervention troubles existing categories and dividing lines. By donning the hijab and introducing it into an arena from which it and Muslims in general were traditionally excluded, Mirza forces one to consider the gap between Muslimness, however that may be defined, actually, and its outward signs. It immediately challenges those viewers who might conflate the one, a head covering piece of cloth, with the other, the essence of the faith. It drives a wedge between them, as it were. We can hear applied Judith Butler's insights originally related to issues of gender about the potential subversive quality of masquerade. Arguing against any such things as an essence of femininity, Butler famously contends that femaleness is brought into being through the act of performing roles in a certain sanctioned feminine way. This performance or masquerade can be troubled by its subversive repetition and parodic recontextualization. Butler cites the exaggerated performances involved in drag and camp as examples. 
We would suggest that in a similar way, Shazia Mirza's stage performances in those years after 9-11 operated as masquerades, raising questions about whether Muslimness could be finally identified and pinned down, or whether in fact it was always being confused with its outward signifiers, especially in the case of women. We quote Butler but insert the word Muslimness in place of femininity used in Butler's original. And I'll sort of read you the quote from Butler with the Muslimness inserted. She says, the question here is whether masquerade conceals a Muslimness that might be understood as genuine or authentic, or whether masquerade is the means by which Muslims, Muslimness and contests over its authenticity are produced. Unquote. Effectively, Mirza is encoding the cultural identity of Muslimness as it is perceived by the viewer. In other words, she is subverting a stereotype by employing, repeating, and exaggerating it. In a postmodern sense, it might be claimed that this kind of act is what Butler calls a parodic recontextualization of a dominant stereotype about Muslim women, an imitation that effectively calls into question any idea of an original truth behind the image. Mirza's work and that of her American counterpart, Tisa Hami, who employs a similar stage strategy to confront ideas of Muslim women as weak and voiceless, has a double target. What are being challenged are both the racist naturalization of the host culture and the misogynistic naturalization of some conservative Islamic gender codes. Mirza has encountered much criticism and some actual physical opposition from conservative Muslims who object to her supposedly sacrilegious performance of Muslim femininity. The key here is that locus of misrecognition. The viewer doing the stereotyping is that which is under attack, not religious faith nor notions of piety as such. Mirza's brand of hyperperformativity challenges binary stereotypes by creating momentarily at least a third location that registers the fluidity of linguistic and cultural codes making up modern Britishness. What are we expecting in the moment between the emergence onto the stage of this slight, soberly dressed, hijab-wearing Muslim woman and the moment when she opens her mouth and begins her routine? The mismatch between the small, gaunt figure and the sharp patter which emerges from her enacts a moment of what one might call cultural estrangement, alienating the audience from its preconceptions, something that will be equally true for a white Western viewer familiar with supposed truisms about Muslim womanhood, and for a Muslim viewer who might not expect such great incongruity between outward signs and the reality beneath. At first sight, there is an undecidability about her stage presence, something that challenges the audience to venture out from their cultural comfort zones and perhaps to recognize that there is a much greater degree of borrowing and plurality in cultural identities than official rhetoric often allows. Shazia Mirza then is no Islamic Barbie doll, blandly reflecting back fixed and idealized images of femininity. Her deliberately overdetermined performance works in a sense to unpick the stitching of ethnic and culturally essentialist readings of religion and gender. However, it could be that the performer herself is, in the end, trapped by the persona she has created. Mirza, for example, stopped wearing her hijab-topped outfit after a few years, complaining that she had begun to feel trapped by it and by the burden of representing Muslims. Perhaps the, con the, the tactic of confronting a stereotype through the deployment of one of its main constituent parts is only a beginning. The danger of typecasting the performer's version of stereotyping is never far away. Nonetheless, the mismatch between visual image and articulating subject does work to deny those pigeonholing demands from culturalists of one side or another for what Bakirati Mani has called perfect reproductions of nation and culture, demands that always seem to focus on female attire. The undecidability of strategies of self-presentation which emphasize hybridity or which play around with the expectations of the interlocutor confuse and frustrate the simple operation of stereotyping which always works through neat demarcations and closed-off identities. 
Mirza's success owes something to the recently trumpeted no phenomenon of visibly Muslim subjects, those who choose through dress, beards, and so on to outwardly display their faith and cultural orientation. Of course, in other ethnicities, this first self-fashioning has been embraced as one of the birthrights of multicultural societies. Um, however, as we observe throughout our book, when it comes to Muslims, the meanings attached to such decisions by non-Muslim onlookers are almost entirely negative. Once more, perhaps comedy can play a part in confronting such a response, which is, after all, simply one of prejudice. The debate around the Danish cartoon controversy of 2006 quickly degenerated into cliches about Western freedom of speech versus Muslim intolerance. The more interesting question of conflicting notions of the role of humor was quickly buried beneath more apocalyptic interpretations of the affair. Whether something is funny or not is in the end a matter of personal preference. However, it is revealing that it was around the issue of humor that the cultural battle lines were drawn. Azhar Usman, the burly, bearded, and visibly Muslim third of the U.S. comedy trio Allah Made Me Funny, observed, quote, the cartoons are the single flashpoint that has defined the Islam and comedy debate. And I think that it's a result of the fact that Islam has become politicized. Some people think that being a Muslim is about going out onto the streets and waving placards about rather than connecting with God and their faith on a personal level. I don't go shouting the street. I get off get up on stage and make jokes about it, unquote. Allah Made Me Funny is a group composed of three US Muslims with different ethnic and cultural backgrounds. Usman is Indian American, Muhammad Amir is Palestinian American, and the founder of the company, Preacher Moss, is African American. They thereby represent a few of the variety of backgrounds that go to make up the Muslim diaspora in the US. And each brings the resulting cultural inflections to bear in his stand-up comedy routine. For instance, Preacher Moss is quick to draw analogies between being black in the US and being Muslim. What links these identities through Moss's wry delivery is an experience of exclusion and victimization, although he never insists upon such terms, and the rueful sideways view of the world that results and which makes for humor. Indeed, the trio move between what might one call Muslim in-jokes about the paradoxes and peculiarities of Muslim life and practices, and material which might have a wider appeal, having to do with the inherent absurdity of airport security checks, policing, and homeland security policies. In a sense, Allah Made Me Funny's broad joviality is a less disturbing, perhaps less radical comedy vehicle than Shazia Mirza or Tisa Hami's deliberate transgression of expected gender norms. 
Nevertheless, there is always a knowing awareness in their comedy of the proximity of material that is halal acceptable and that which might be considered haram, forbidden by Muslim sections of his audience. In fact, the comedians play around with the always subjective distinction between the two, playfully putting a toe across the line and threatening to bring up something that could be offensive, but then coyly retreating or moving off on another tangent. They are comfortable with discomfort, however, and these moments often constitute the high point of their shows. The moment when instead of laughter there is momentary silence or a slight intake of breath among the audience, wary of what may be coming next. As such, they do after all acknowledge that boundaries are there to be pushed. Unfortunately, this cagey irony is sometimes lost on those reporters who have covered the troops' international tours and who seem more interested in what the comedian's faith means. They cannot say rather than what they actually include. The hackneyed question, what won't you joke about, seems to follow the comedians wherever they go, and they invariably answer cheerfully that blasphemy and cruelty have no place in what they do. Although it is a legitimate question, it is one that is clearly framed by the stereotypes of Muslims as po-faced malcontents, with no feeling for the lighter side of life and an, and an inability to laugh at themselves that were reanimated by the cartoon controversy. Context is all important here. Consider, for example, the absurdity of asking a family entertainer why he doesn't use profanity in his act, or a holiday camp comedian why he doesn't employ cutting-edge satire. To suggest that all comedy should offend, push boundaries and unsettle is in itself a culturally loaded judgment, and one that doesn't even apply to all Western comedy, let alone that with roots in other cultures. Different genres of comedy will obviously have a different relationship to the ways in which society recognizes its foibles and peculiarities. For the most part, these genre forms that have dominated television comedy have been domestic sitcoms, coming-of-age narratives and comedies involving mismatched buddies. In recent years, these venerable forms have found themselves playing host to the trials and tribulations of Muslim experience, at least as they have emerged through the filtration systems of the North American television commissioning process. And because I'm short on time, I'm sort of going to skip my little spiel about Aliens in America, the sitcom, which was a short-lived series on the CW television network and centered around the Tolchuk family in Wisconsin. Uh, but um, I'll just say briefly that it sort of does tackle directly post 9-11 ignorance and fear of the cultural other, yet, you know, it's really our point of interest and identification is made to be with the growing pains of the teenage mis misfit Justin, who is the main character, and his friend Raja, who's brought in as the cultural other, and any alienation or dislocation felt by him is kind of smoothed out to the central sort of thing. But anyway, that that's just sort of... Um, um, I, I, I suppose very sort of shortly to say in the end the funny Pakistani who is Raja in the show come, who comes among us exposes our prejudices but in the end he turns out just like us so it kind of normalizes him quite a lot. There is certainly something to be said in favor of the show's message of humanist tolerance but perhaps it misses a chance to go deeper into the labyrinth of modern cultural tensions. More ambitious is the CBC sitcom Little Mosque on the Prairie created by Zerka Nawaz the title plays on viewer memories of the 1970s NBC adaptation of Laura Ingalls Wilder's m memoir of frontier life, Little House on the pra Prairie. Yet Little Mosque foregoes the twee moralizing that sometimes marked the older series and instead takes an incisive approach to tackling community relations and stereotyping. If Charles Ingalls and his family were 19th century pioneers forging a new life in the untamed Midwest, in Little Mosque the extended Muslim family of Mercy Saskatchewan blazes its own trail by establishing a place of worship in the local church hall facing fearsome rednecks and hostile natives along the way. Um, can I play the clip? I don't, do I have time? Sure. To? <laughs> we might have a little less time for questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is the start, this is the first <laughs> series, the first show, the beginning.
Sorry, much as I'd like to play more, I'll, I'll sort of very quickly wrap up. Importantly, our sympathetic identification is with the harassed, beleaguered, yet undaunted Muslim group in the program. We are taken inside their daily lives, loves, and dilemmas. They are normalized, shall we say, and our engagement with the non-Muslim community surrounding them is less detailed. In the course of the first series, for example, we meet Yasser Hamoudi, the construction company owner, his convert wife, Sarah, and his daughter, Rayan, who wears the hijab, but who is a doctor by profession. The family reflect middle-class aspirational values shared by immigrants. They are all outsiders trying to fit in while retaining their religious faith. However, it is this very faith which signifies suspicious and possibly violent tendencies to white society that disrupts the customary narrative of social advancement. Um, and as you saw, you know, the different characters embody different Islamic ethnicities. The congregation's new imam is detained by security officers, etc. The issues that exercise this group week by week include dilemmas about when to start fasting for Ramadan, how to curb the enthusiasm of an overzealous new convert, and the difficulty of extricating Yasser from a second marriage engineered for him by his formidable mother. All of this takes place against a background of suspicion articulated most forcefully by the right-wing local radio talk show host, Fred Tupper, who takes every opportunity to castigate the interlopers and their nefarious eastern ways. If it were just a case of embattled Muslims and bigoted white people, Little Mosque would probably offer little of note. However, the show foregrounds stereotypes and kinds of misrecognition as central to its interpretation of self-other identity formation at a personal level too. Everyone in the show misreads everyone else, seemingly. The talk show host misreads the Muslims, but the Muslims also misread each other, not least because of the comparative three-dimensionality of their characters. Yasser's business instincts mean that his motives are always mixed. His wife struggles to be a better Muslim against the ever-present temptations of her Western lifestyle and tastes. Baba is constantly baffled by his daughter's refusal to behave like a good Muslim girl. And the smoldering tension in the relationship between Amar and Rayan always threatens to break up into something more romantic, but never does. Misreading and miscommunication take place on account of age, gender, ethnicity, and background. The result is a comedy that, while deploying its fair share of cliched situations and stock figures, also presents Muslim life in the round and not set against a more normal majority population from which they represent. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> some kind of deviation. Everyone's a little bit strange in Little Mosque, so it doesn't really matter. Each of these comedy shows and performers works from a recognition of the stifling presence, but also the comedic potential of crude stereotypes. The best of them realize that it is not enough simply to reverse the stereotype, but that one needs to challenge the conventional wisdom on which stereotypes depend, either through parody, pointing out inconsistencies and absurdities, or by employing a shift of focus, which forces the ethno-normalized viewer to take a look at things from the other side. Thus, comedy can be an important tool in combating framing depictions of Muslims and Muslimness. It is not being proposed here that all Muslims should suddenly take to the stage, start parodying themselves, or take their religion less seriously. Rather, we are suggesting that since stereotypes exist nowhere but in the eye of the beholder, challenges which work ironically with a knowledge of likely prejudices and which then directly frustrate or confound them might have a role to play in loosening the grip of reductive images. It could well be that the inherent irreverence of comedy itself uh, off, always offers a space to blow apart narrow, dull constructions of cultural separation and a hostile emphasis on uniqueness. In this way, we might begin to find new ways of seeing and moving beyond the frame. Sorry for a little bit too much.